Hello and welcome to um, the second episode of this brand new era of the Silmarillion Film Podcast, where we uh, where we podcast on Thursday evenings. That's right, in, at least in U.S. Uh, time zone. So it's an exciting new era. Unfortunately, notice how uh, more wide awake program. Dave sounds. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Dave is super have to wide be. awake. Un- unfortunately, not <laughs> not. Not very um, inclusive of our European listeners, I'm afraid, but uh, but um, but hopefully opening up opportunities for other listeners to join us live, and certainly probably a little bit easier on me, albeit harder on you too. Sorry, guys. So anyway, um, uh, so here we are. We're getting going. I am joined, as always, by uh, the Tolkien professor, Corey Olson, and the Tolkien maven, Trish Lambert, and we're talking casting today, right? That is right. We're talking casting today. Yeah. And it occurs to me, you know, that we talk about like the second uh, episode in the new era. Of course, everybody listening asynchronously is going to be like, how is session 19 of season four, the second episode of yeah, the, new, the, of the new era? <laughs> <laughs> right. They won't notice the difference. Uh, but yes, for those of us who are participating live, it has uh, been a major change shifting to Thursday nights. Um uh, but we've been enjoying that so far and uh, glad to be uh, uh, sticking together. But yeah, so casting tonight. So just to clarify, you know, we've done our we've done casting episodes before, but this is the first time we have ever done what we're planning to do tonight. I mean, unless you count what we did a couple weeks ago with the frame. Um because before we've done sort of casting calls and had people vote and everything, and then we'd go through and occasionally veto those uh, democratically elected uh, uh, appointments, but not, but not usually. Um, however, that we decided to add a step to the process this year, which is where we do a casting call, not just uh, uh, you know sort of doing an, you know having open nominations because we want to make sure, you know, this is a time for us to go through and think about each individual character. Um, and this has been a really fun process. Uh, you know, even when we've just started doing this with the frame recently, the opportunity to think about, okay, you know, what, what kind of picture do we have? What do we want? What are we looking for, uh, for each one of these characters? And uh, before, we never had really done that on the podcast until we were sort of evaluating the nominees. And it was gently pointed out to us that it's a little late in the game to be doing that. We should maybe do that before we st- we open nominations. So that's what we're doing this year. Um, uh, but anyway, exactly. So this is the casting call. Exactly. Um all right. So, but before just uh, one quick announcement, uh, we, we are coming back into regional moot season at Signum. Of course, Myth Moot is uh, our big event of the year, uh, and that is sadly in the past now. But it does mean that it's time for us to be looking forward to other fun events that are coming up soon. And the fall is our busiest moot season of the year. Uh, one new moot that we're beginning this year is finally getting our New England moot together, uh, and. And that is scheduled for the 29th of September. So that is uh, that is actually a uh, Sunday, not a Saturday. It would be, which is a little different than we've normally done our regional moots. Um, we'll be getting together and doing some stuff on Saturday night uh, in advance, but um, the the actual moot itself will be uh, on Sunday, and the location will be in Amherst. Excuse me, Amherst, Massachusetts. So I grew up uh, when, when I was in high school and uh, middle school like for eight years I lived in the town of Amherst New Hampshire that was my hometown when I lived here before I went off to college um, the similar town named after the same person uh, uh, in Massachusetts is pronounced different you don't pronounce the H in the New Hampshire you pronounce the H in Amherst in, in Amherst Massachusetts, you don't pronounce uh, the H. Uh, so the combination of the fact that the folks in Massachusetts don't know how to pronounce the name and the fact that there's a really substandard uh, liberal arts school, which happens to be the rival of the liberal arts school to which I went, um, uh, uh, there has prejudiced me against that town for a long time. So I'm glad to build really Sounds positive like associations. <laughs> yes. I'm glad to build really positive associations uh, with Amherst, Massachusetts. So I'm looking forward to being there it's a really great location it's going to be it's uh, it's it's uh, a really central spot easy to get to from almost anywhere in massachusetts easy to come up from connecticut down from either vermont or new hampshire a little hard for maine but there's not much we can do about that um maine people uh at the least will be used to um you know having 
<laughs> difficulties <laughs> with traveling places. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So just save the date on that. There'll be more information available. We have a call for papers that'll be going out very, very soon. Um, so just uh, stay tuned to the Signum University website looking for more information on that. Uh, Middle Moot also. Our Midwest Moot is going to be in I back up in Iowa again this year. We're down in Kansas City last year. We're in Iowa this year. Uh, on Saturday, October 12th is the date for that. And the call for papers for that is out uh, on the uh, on the website. So more to come. We'll be looking at doing a Magnolia Moot uh, down in North Carolina again. And also some stuff out in California again. So those, those will all be happening in the fall. So um, uh, very excited about those. We'll be giving you some more information as we have further details to release there. So, um, uh, yeah. Oh, hey, cool. Nick, you might be able to go to the Magnolia Moot. Yep, we're looking at that. We're, you know, something like uh, Halloween-ish uh, vague area uh, is what we're looking at. We haven't firmed up the date yet for Magnolia Moot. But, yep, that's... Around when and around where it's going to... I think we're going to hold it in Charlotte, North Carolina again, uh, as we did last time. Uh, but anyway, th those are those are the current plans. So lots underway in the moot front. Uh, and of course, we've got next year's moots coming together. Sunshine moot is set for March and Tex moot set again for January. So uh, uh, good times there. Anyway, okay. So just wanted to make sure everybody knew about moot season beginning again. Now, let's... Um, get to our casting. So here's our big, uh, our big slide here. This is the list of people for whom we need uh, to come up with casting concepts uh, for season four. These are all people who have not been cast. Of course, many of our characters have been cast in season three or even back in season two. Um, but we have a bunch of people who are new characters this, this uh, uh, year, and we need to cast them. So first we have adult Idril. What are we looking for in adult Idril? Of course, the primary characteristic of Idril Celebrindal is her feet. So uh, I don't know if we have to have a kind of creepy casting call where we're checking out people's feet to see who who's who has the silveriest feet that you know of. You know, or like how can that be cosmetically uh, um, uh, uh, affected? I don't know. I think we can probably handle the silveriness with makeup. I'm not sure, but um, I was gonna make. This is going to make for some interesting auditions. <laughs> it is going to make for some interesting auditions. Um, what are some other associations that you guys have? Like what, Thinking about Idril's character, what would you say is most essential uh, for Idril? Um, one of the things <sighs> that's interesting about her is that, apart from, again, like the feet, uh, which come up in her name, obviously, um, uh the primary thing that we get about Idril, in which, you know, where we have brought her up several times uh, during the course of our discussions already for this season, is she's very wise. You know, she so like all her primary characteristics are mental, you know, intellectual, um, mm -hmm. rather than anything specifically physical. Uh, you know, anything like, uh, you know, with. Luthien, for instance, right? We need someone who can sing and dance and has, like, can carry off the appropriate kind of hair, right? Uh, you know, those are those are some of the things that we need for uh, for Luthien. Um, less uh, less obvious characteristics for an Idril. I think um, uh, we. Um, <laughs> Nick is suggesting we can always hire a foot double. Yeah, true enough. True enough. Um, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> if we need a foot double for Idril, we can always we can always get one, I suppose. Um, yeah. So I, I I do think we were looking for a blonde Idril. Um, well, yeah, because uh, we have these reference characters already. We've got you know Elenway and Turgon, and then the young Idril. Yes. We you know, sort of like all blondies. Yes, yes, they were Already. all they were all fair. So I think we um, we would want someone blonde for this. Um, I I kind of I could be talked out of this, but I would picture Idril actually as someone relatively small, um, uh, someone sort of small and slight. I. 
maybe it's because I think of her primarily, uh, not primarily as a child, but like primarily as as Turgon's child, and the way she is sort of there as like the princess of Gondolin. Um, I mean, if you think about it, Idril is like one of the only, uh, one of Tolkien's characters who could play like a Disney princess role, right? I mean, like she is the princess of Gondolin who has no mom. Um, you know, she she's like a perfect role for a Disney princess. Um, I'm not saying, obviously we cast her like a Disney princess, but I'm just saying she's in that kind of, uh, she, she, is, in, she is in a princess role. Uh, and that role, you know, the role of something like princess um, and many of the things traditionally associated with princess, uh, by which I mean, right? So somebody who is in a position who is a daughter, who is the heir of the king, who is her father, um, and is therefore the object of desire and political machinations by other men in the court, right? That's a surprisingly unusual dynamic in Tolkien. For all that, it's a very common dynamic in, you know, fairy tale tradition and all that kind of thing. It's quite an unusual dynamic in Tolkien, but it is definitely there with Idril. Um, and I think I'm just, I'm, I'm here is me trying to like unpack some of the like psychological reasons why I've always imagined Idril as being rather small and slight. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there it is. Um, you know, this is this is the position now. Of course, you know the prime as I say the primary and and, and also because the primary elements of, of her uh, are uh, are intellectual. As I said, you know she is smart, she is wise, uh, and she is also perhaps foresighted. Um, uh, and so therefore, um, I mean, it would be refreshing to have, I feel like, I feel like there's a tendency to stray toward tall for elves. So, right. Right. It'd be nice to have a little diversity. I just put in, I don't know why, but Amanda Seyfried came to mind and I just put her IMDB thing in for you guys to see. She's five, two and a half. (laughs) Perfect. I know. Five, two. I mean, I know we don't want to be like saying specific names so we you might not want to look at that but that's who i thought of sure was, uh, yeah no we can yeah we exactly we don't need to make specifics we don't want to bias yeah. the voting too badly um but yeah somebody somebody who's and, and again it, that i think it would be kind of cool to have the effect of idril be her um Again, it is like the penetration of her eyes and her her mind uh, and her wisdom. She's one somebody that some that people listen to, but she doesn't need to be, and even I think maybe shouldn't be any kind of a physically. And you know, we don't need a like statuesque Idril, you know. Um. So, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um. I think that would. Uh, I think that would all work. <laughs> you guys can't, can't help yourself. See, my own ignorance about actors and actresses makes it super easy for me to avoid concrete suggestions, but uh, <laughs> I, see, I see you guys are having a hard time with that so far. Uh, but yeah, I think that's my concept again. Now, keep in mind, when, when we do these concepts, if you guys in nominating somebody want to make a case against that, it's totally fine. So like, for instance, if one of you has a more... Uh, you know, sort of like uh, taller, uh, uh, you know, sort of more physically robust Idril in mind, you can suggest that and make a case for it, right? Explain why you think, you know, someone with that kind of a physical type would work better uh, in your mind Um, uh, or why that actress might work better for Idril despite the differences in physical type from what we were thinking. Um, Totally. I mean, I'm not saying that this necessarily has to be the way. I'm just going through and thinking through uh, the way that I think that we could uh, sort of do these characters and what I would initially look for. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Bree says uh, she treats adult Idril as very Valkyrie-esque. Um, uh, I, I can see it. Uh, and, you know, there's something kind of attractive to having an Idril who would be like standing back to back with two or, you know, fighting during the fall of Gondolin. Um, I'm not absolutely opposed to that, but I think the primary reason why I find myself resistant to a more um, uh, a more physically powerful version of Idril is that I wouldn't want to... Uh, 
um, I want to, I want to upplay the significant, I want her to be somebody, first of all, whom some people might, um, not overlook, uh, she's too important a person in Gondola to overlook, who's going to overlook the daughter of Turgon, but, um, uh, well, I mean, I guess in a crowded room, if she's really short, you might overlook her, but no, I mean, uh, somebody whom you wouldn't necessarily glance at and be like, whoa, I've totally got to take that person seriously, right? She should be somebody whose uh, forcefulness of will and whose who's, uh, presence of mind like demands attention and respect once you know her, but you might not take her seriously. You know, you might not uh, uh, really... It's not necessarily something that just jumps out at you as soon as you glance at her. Well, um, you, don't, you can yeah. underestimate made her absolutely basically. yes she can be underestimated yeah, I think yes casting casting pre presents an opportunity to maybe exploit uh standard stereotypes where mm -hmm. if we if we cast somebody who's a little more diminutive maybe um the viewer like if we if we cast like a like a you know a physically imposing person then there'll be an expectation that she would fight in the battle right. Uh, if we don't, um, then 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 maybe um, her contributions become sort of a revelation. And you know, and, and her contributions aren't really um, martial. It's right. more sort of being farsighted enough to prepare, right? And uh, and to provide leadership and to save her people. So exactly. And I mean, and the fact is, Myglin does underestimate her, right? I mean, she yeah. manages to, uh, like, under Myglin's nose. Uh, bring about, you know, create something almost like a conspiracy um, in which she manages to, like, have that tunnel dug without him knowing about it, right? You know, she manages to, to, to pull that off and keep it secret, and he does not, you know, he doesn't think of it. He doesn't realize that she's doing it. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Nick says, uh, since she's grown up from childhood with much older people surrounding her, you know, her smallness might be kind of symbolic of the fact that most of the Gondolindrum see her as a child. Yeah, and Nick, I think perhaps that's also one of the reasons why I've always thought of her as small, too, as I've always thought of her that way, too. But yes, this idea, Nick, of... I think it would be really nice to create the visual effect of having her look like the kid whom everybody has to take care of, Right. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the child of the gondolindrum, um, the precious child of the gondolindrum, but she in fact is, uh, you know, Dave, exactly as you say, as you say, despite the fact that she, you know, might look small and slight, uh, and even perhaps, uh, you know, childlike in her features, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm imagining, again, not like statuesque beauty, but a face that is more cute than beautiful, right? With Idril is kind of what I'm picturing. But again, despite that, uh, and the way that people might over might underestimate her or overlook her as a consequence, uh, she nevertheless is uh, someone who is actually in who is actually the leader. I see her being the one who really is the leader. With I mean, Tuor's good, right? Tuor's strong. He's one of the greatest, you know, human warriors of the first age. Uh, but I, she, I think, is clearly the one who's who's making the strategies in that in that family. You know, um, uh, you know, I think that she is, you know, really the visionary and the leader um, of the two. He can be charismatic and, you know, a good leader of people as well. Um, but he's not the strategist. Um yeah. Bree says that we have to remember that she'll be paired with uh, Tuor, who is extremely tall. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's OK. I actually like that. I uh, the, if if there's a huge height difference, if there's like a foot and a half t height difference between the two of them, I'm cool with that, actually, because, again, this is something which should I mean, there should be a way right? Tuor and Idril are one of the two big, you know, human elf pairings of the first age and it should look a little bit just as we were, you know, when we were talking about Baron and Luthien 
uh, thinking about casting Baron and saying, I don't know, this conversation came up a while back, despite the fact that Baron hasn't been born yet. In fact, humanity didn't exist. But nevertheless, we were talking about it. And when we talked about it, we talked about wanting Baron to look really rough, right? Not to be really gorgeous, right? But be, you know, mo much more rugged uh, than, um, uh, than pretty himself, right? There should be a contrast. There should be... They, they they have to work together, right? As a couple, they have to work. Uh, they can't merely be comical or weird on screen. But if you look at them, there should be something about them that says that's an odd pairing, right? Because they are an odd pairing. One's a man, one's a human, and one's an elf, right? Uh, so anyway, um, yeah. Ooh, Nick says he'd like to cast someone who is known as a child actress, which would invite the audience to feel the same way about her that the Gondolindrum do. That's a pretty cunning idea if we can if we can pull that off. Uh, I, I kind of like that. But OK, I think it's enough for Idril. Uh, uh, I guess she doesn't have to be super short, but that's that's my picture of her anyway. Um, Ecthelion. Well, let's think about Ecthelion and Glorfindel together. OK. Glorfindel. So, I kind of feel like if Glorfindel is not really gorgeous, we're going to have a riot on our hands, <laughs> right? I mean, like, I'm not even going to suggest we don't uh, try to cast a gorgeous guy as Glorfindel, right? Um, so... Clearly, I think that, you know, Gl Glorfindel is really kind of the golden boy of Gondolin, right? He is, uh, you know, his, he, he's uh, very notably blonde, right? Um, and I think, you know, needs to be, uh, you know, we were just talking about his description, uh, the description that's given of him in the Fellowship of the Ring, which, of course, keep in mind, doesn't have to all 100% apply to him uh, back in his first incarnation here uh, in uh, uh, in the First Age. But whatever. Um, nevertheless, yeah. So blonde, tall, uh, you know, I would kind of want him to sort of, uh, I would... In my mind, I want somebody who can like out Orlando Bloom, Orlando Bloom, basically, especially since Orlando Bloom is not blonde. Right. And so therefore, I always felt like he looked weird in the blonde wig that they put him in with Legolas because he doesn't look blonde. Right. His coloration does not match the wig very well at all. Um, so anyway, he did. He did look a bit odd. I thought it was weird, uh, but. Yeah, I've never fully understood that. I've never fully understood the impulse to be like, well, all you got to do, like, take a dark, you know, like a, a person with, like, dark hair and dark eyebrows and everything and just, like, slap a blonde wig on and then they're blonde, right? Well, sometimes that works, but often it really doesn't. Um, they did it to his dad, too. I mean, Lee Pace isn't a blonde either. Again. True. Weird. Even weirder uh, what, with the eyebrows. Even weirder with those eyebrows. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, in fact, I think the only reason I, I, I didn't feel quite so strongly about it with Lee Pace is that I barely even noticed the hair because all I could see was the eyebrows. Were right? the eyebrows. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, on the crown, too, kind of, you know. Yeah, well, but yeah, chiefly the eyebrows. But anyway, yeah, so. Well, you, well, you know I'm going to be pretty judgmental about Glorfindel. I mean, because, you know, he exactly. and I go way back. Exactly. Well, but but Trish, I'm right, right? I mean, he has to be he has, right. to be he has to be gorgeous, gorgeous. right? I Absolutely. mean, there's, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I that's, and it's interesting because there are there are not that many other of the elf characters, um, for whom like pure physical attractiveness, I would list as right. like a, a major priority, yeah. right? Uh, but. <laughs> But with Gorfindel, I think I'd have I I kind of have to go there. Um, I mean, I'm thinking he has to be so beautiful it almost hurts your eyes to look at him. You almost kind of have to. It's like looking at the sun. You know, you can't look at him for too long, kind of thing. Yeah, that's all we need. We don't ask much. That's all we need. <laughs> that's all we need. Yeah, like among the men. I mean, the challenge is among the men. Turin needs to be really hot too. Right. Um, so, that, I mean, there will be yeah, some other places yeah. where we have to just go for like she. And of course, we've already done Luthien. Um, uh, of course, the most uh, important character of this of that kind in this regard, you know, a place. Oh, Demi. 
bite your tongue. She says, I wonder how Jason Momoa would look as a blonde. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we may have to depend on our on our Scandinavian friends to come up with the right actor here because I mean, he is blonde, right? I think yeah, he is, exactly. He is blonde, you know? yeah. And and did we got so is Ekfelian going to kind of be in the same mold but not quite as gorgeous? So okay, I, that's why I wanted to pair the two of them together because Ekfelian and Gorfindel are really two like the primary captains of uh, of Gondolin. Ekfelian, uh, of course, really being one of the Ekfelian is going to be needs to be in many ways I think um, the um, the most rugged I mean the description of Ecthelion's death I mean there is nothing like it in all of Tolkien uh, I, I mean in the like the only time it's actually described uh, not mentioned but described so not the published Silmarillion but in the Book of Lost Tales version of the fall of Gondolin um, his death is the, I mean so you know think of all of the like action uh, hero you know action movie heroes who have like sustained 15 times the number of wounds that any human body could actually sustain and keep fighting like that's that's Ecthelion, right um, so he is he's of that kind I do like the idea Tony of him and Gorfindel being almost opposites I would yeah, be totally like cool too, casting somebody who is actually homely as Ecthelion. yeah um, he does not Earl have to be Bronson gorgeous kind of character you know I mean it I don't know why I thought of, I mean, he's not with us anymore, but Charles Bronson, that kind of, you know, dark, rugged, kind of almost rocky build. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, somebody, he needs to be physically powerful and imposing, I think, much more than, you know, Glorfindel will be, you know, uh, grace and speed and Ecthelion would be power. Now, Rog... Uh, whom we're going to be getting to uh, uh, in a moment too. He, of course, also is going to play a, a prominent role, um, and he, uh, in some ways, I think, needs to be the biggest of uh, physically largest of all of the captains of uh, the the captains of Gondolin. Now, of course, Rog is not one of the Gondolindrum. The story uh, is going to be that he's one of the one of Fingolfin's people, who ends up retreating uh, with. Uh, the Gondolindrum into Gondolin after uh, the near Nyth Arnoidiad. So that's why he's there at the fall of Gondolin. But he's going to be one of the captains. Um, and um, uh, and anyway, yeah, he's going to be uh, a, um, um, the, you know, like guy fighting with enormous hammer uh, in uh, in the final battle, you know, who dies in a blaze of glory on the battlefield. Um, so... Rog, I think, needs to be Nick, physical. Nick's physical. on a digital de-aging streak here. <laughs> I think we're gonna we're gonna have to do that eventually with some of our actors. <laughs> yes, you know, just naturally. But um, he's very big into this digital de-aging thing. <laughs> right, exactly. So we're gonna <laughs> digitally de-age Sylvester Stallone for Rog. Okay. <laughs> like I'm not saying that I don't think like Rambo era Sylvester Stallone it wouldn't be good casting for Rog. I would take that. I absolutely would. Um, uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Um, Bree says I that. I think uh, I'm. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I think I think I'm influenced by the character he played, but Mark Ruffalo comes to mind, but probably more in his Hulk form than in his regular form. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Bree says that Ecthelion is a rectangle, Rog is a square, and Glorfindel is a line. <laughs> yeah. I like that way of thinking about them. Um, Nick thinks that Stallone's too short for Rog. Oh, so you would do Stallone for Ecthelion? I could live with that. I could live with that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so those are... Those are uh, and let's remember they're like sort of 
their narrative, their primary, their primary narrative functions. We may end up with more for them as we get into the story of Gondolin more, especially in season five, and then moving forward with the arrival of Tuor later on. Um, you know, we'll have some more roles, which will kind of, I think, flesh out those characters a little bit more than we ever get uh, in Tolkien's writings. But um, the, I mean, the, so when I'm thinking about these guys, the three things I'm primarily thinking of are their their deaths, right? Their death scenes. Um, uh, and obviously with Glorfindel, we get a little more because we get to, you know, we meet him, obviously, in The Lord of the Rings. So uh, we have a little bit more on Glorfindel. But uh, with Ecthelion and Rog, I'm primarily thinking of them in battle uh, and how they're going to die. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, Tony says that those three, Rog, Glorfindel, and Ecthelion, should almost be like the three amigos. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't. Well, that think... would make uh, that would make Glorfindel Steve Martin, right? <laughs> no, not the comedians cast as the three <laughs> amigos, <laughs> but as I don't think they would be suitable at all. But rather, yes, like the three of them should be uh, should really be a unit. I mean, I'm kind of thinking, of course, I mean, it's a little early to be thinking too deeply into Gondolin politics and everything. But um, we we're not I don't think we're going to have enough roles, really, like enough narrative jobs. Right. Uh, to to have like the full captains of all of the houses that are listed in in uh, uh, in the Book of Lost Tales, who are mostly, you know, of course, just like names right in the in the Book of Lost Tales um, uh, description of their houses and their um, liveries and things like that. Um, so for, to me, uh, the leadership, uh, you know, under Turgon, the leadership of um, of Gondolin, we've got Ecthelion, Glorfindel, and Rog. Like those three are together as a unit, and then we've got Maeglin, right? Um, and I think he's going to be the sort of strange fourth wheel there. Um, and there's going to there there should definitely be a, like you know which of these things is not like the other thing going on, and and you know him feeling like he's not given the proper respect uh, because he's not really accepted as an equal by Ecthelion, Glorfindel, and Rog, all of whom you know, find him a little creepy as lots of people do. Um, um, but, um, anyway, yep. Well, we'll see again, Nick, I'm not closing the door on the rest of the captains of the houses of, you know, the great houses of Gondolin, like whatever, we'll see what happens when we get there. But, um, but we know we're going to want Ixelin, Gorfindel, Rog, uh, Mithros and Tuor and Arevel and Idril, right? And Turgon. So that's eight really important characters in the leadership of Gondolin. And you that meant seems Miglin, right? Not Mithros. Kind of a lot. Right? Wait, did you I, mean I, did you I say Mithros? Oh, you meant Mithros. Yeah, Mithros. You meant Mithros. Mithros. Uh, so, you know. Yeah. yeah. Practically interchangeable. Wait, don't tell Marie I said that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and exactly, yeah, as several of you are saying, even if we only have them there as uh, uh, as glorious extras, yes, exactly. They can show up, especially on the battlefield. Like, there will be plenty of opportunities for, um, you know, like red shirt gondolindrum captains <laughs> during the battle at the end. Uh, so we can represent them. It's totally fine. Um, anyway, yeah, Nick, we're, we're going to talk about Rog's renaming soon. Um, well, let me say, if we get through our casting list. So are we cool with this? Um, I don't care if Rog is... Uh, Rog should probably be dark, right? Uh, uh, dark of hair, not... Um, uh, not and blonde. And swarthy. Yeah, swarthy, swarthy, sure. He can be swarthy. Absolutely. Um, Ecthelion. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I really like the idea of Ecthelion and Glorfindel being like the best friends that look like a very like ill-matched pair. Um that seems that seems fine to me. Um, okay, uh, Evelos, who is Angrod's wife and the probable mother of Oradreth, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so this is the character now. Rog and Evelos are two of those who will be captured by Sauron during the first wave of his catch and release program. Well, catch program. Anyway, Rog is going to escape. Evelos is going to be the one who's going to have the spell of Bottomless Dread uh, slammed on her, right, by uh, Morgoth. 
Um, and then we have Meryl, who's Aura Dreth's uh, Cinda wife, whom uh, we talked about before, and who's they're going to be like married relatively swiftly. Um, uh, oh, Nick says we're going to love what you got. What that we're going to love what they did with Evelos. Uh, they talked about her last week. Okay, I'm excited. Can't wait to can't wait to hear what you guys are going to do with Evelos. Um, uh, I have. Let's see. I have no physical picture in my head about Evelos, as like there is no narrative in Tolkien in which she takes part. So I've never pictured her. Therefore, um, let me think of the role that we want to give her. That is the one who is going to undergo really the most extreme of the psychological trauma suffered by those who are captured and then released. Um, Anil uh, is up there too, but not quite as extreme. He won't be broken in the same way that Ethelos is going to be broken. Um, I do you guys have any trait, any sort of physical types or traits that you think that we should avoid or seek out for Ethelos? Hmm. I mean, she'd probably be dark. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, so she'd be dark, right? Yeah, I think so. Um... I don't know. I mean, it, it, is there some personality trait that we want to have, you know, that we want to see in her prior to her I don't trauma? know. Well, see, part of my problem is now, especially, Nick, with your tantalizing suggestion that you guys have hatched this, you know, uh, really juicy story for her. Now I'm like, well, how am I supposed to know? I don't even know the juicy story now. So, um, I. Uh, yeah, uh, Bree says that uh, uh, these more minor roles seem to just need to match the coloration of their most yeah. prominent relative. True. Yes, yes. Uh, in this case, or a dress. Um, uh, I think now, one of the things that I, when I find myself imagining her, the primary thing that I find myself imagining is a woman who is dark haired but extremely pale skinned um like almost sort of ghostly white uh but see there i think i'm just imagining her post you know uh uh post being broken it might be better to go against that concept tony like you're suggesting to make her more physically imposing um uh to make it sort of more surprising that she's the one that breaks. Well, I mean, not surprising, you know, when like Morgoth lays the whammy on her, but, um, but yeah, to have it be kind of more, uh, more unexpected. Or poignant too. I mean, depending yeah. on like how we get to know her, or what she's like beforehand. Yeah, exactly. I, I, um, I mean, and she's Angrod's wife, right? Uh, so, you know, Angrod is like our most, one of our most fiery non-Feanorians, right? Um, uh, so for him to have a very f sort of physically and emotionally robust wife would kind of work, right? Um, you know, if she were a kind of, you know, partner and counterpart of her fiery husband, um, that would work, I think, um, and would make, you know, her her breaking I don't mean it's not like nothing's gonna make it more tragic it's gonna be tragic whatever she's like but um uh yeah Nick says she's his herald in what we've done so far yeah yeah so having her be somebody who would really uh would expect to you know fight shoulder to shoulder with her husband yeah yeah um yeah that definitely works for me with other loss. Funny though that um, if Ordreth is their son, 
that apple seems to fall so far from the parental trees there. But <laughs> uh, as Oradreth being one of the least fiery of all of the Noldor that we are dealing with here. Well, you know, sometimes kids want to be the opposite of their parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, we'll come back to the Oradreth question. Meryl. Meryl's role, that is, the Cinda woman who marries Oradreth and whom we wanted to marry off to Oradreth fairly swiftly, um, her primary role, she represents, she and Oradreth together are represent, they're sort of symbolizing the initial merging of the Sindar and the Noldor, right? As they're kind of beginning to come together and establish their the realms, many of which have both Sindar and Noldor in them, uh, in Beleriand. So not the 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 the, the really important union of Galadriel and Celeborn, but of course that's really importantly post revelation of the Kinslaying, and so therefore that their union is about seeing beyond these problems, right? It's about reconciliation. It's about forgiveness. Um, with Meryl and Oradreth, it's more a, like, union in innocence, right? Innocent of these problems that are going to happen down the road. Therefore, I'm thinking, you know, uh, Oradreth and Meryl should both look very young. Um, uh, you know, this should look like a an innocent, almost naive young love affair, um, in order to kind of capture the 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 sort of symbolism of that. Um, uh, Rhiannon asks, "Will Meryl still be alive when Oradreth becomes king of Nargothrond?" Don't um, don't know why she shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, she'll have opportunities to die, uh, should we want her to do so, but I don't, I can't for that right now from where I'm, where we're sitting, think of a good reason, uh, to kill her off. Um, uh, the thing, yeah. So the thing with Meryl though, again, she had like, think of all of the things that we are associating with the Sindar, right? Um, comparatively comparatively less sort of sophisticated culture, right? Simpler in not only her uh, her clothing, uh, but also in her habits and behavior, something, I don't know what, a little bit more, less formal and more spontaneous. Um, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, Tony, I agree. She could get killed by Glaurung. There's any number of ways. We, I mean, look. I mean, if we want somebody dead, we've got all kinds of opportunities. But, but yeah, I, I don't. I, I would want a reason to do it, and I don't know a reason. So yeah, Murray says they're kind of assuming she'll probably be uh, alive until the sack of Nargothrond. Makes sense to me. Um, she and Oradreth can kind of can die together. I, I, I think, uh, or I mean, at least at the same time, if not physically together. Um, uh, so yeah, she could be killed by Glaurung in Nargothrond itself. You know, maybe she's, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I can imagine her death scene when Glau like Glaurung killing her, uh, and using that scene as kind of a symbol of the, you know, the, the devastation of Nargothrond, right? The invasion of Nargothrond and I don't know, but anyway, we'll see. Um, We'll see what seems right at the time and how her character develops between now and then, uh, really. Okay. Kurofin's wife. Uh, so Kurofin's wife. Hmm. Hmm. Kurofin's wife. I'm trying to th imagine how I picture Kurafin's marriage. Because, um, 
Yeah, and Nick, we're going to name her. Uh, so, Nick, the way this is all working, there are several unanswered questions uh, on this that are, are here on this slide. Like, we need to rename, we need to deal with Rog's name. We'll explain that more in a little bit later. Uh, we need to, like, firm up Oradreth's parentage, uh, and we need to name Kurafin's wife. Yeah, we're going to get to all those. Marie wisely put the slides for those things after this so that if we got through anything tonight, we would get through the casting list. So we can always come back and finish that up later on. Um, uh, uh, anyway, okay. So Kurafin's wife, whom we'll name later on, um, uh, is... Um, so again, I'm trying to think of how that marriage would work. And in particular, yes, Tony, it's her relationship with Killabrimbor that I was, um, uh, that I'm thinking of, right? Um, yeah, so actually, okay, so yeah, Maria's reminding me that she's the one, she's going to be captured uh, and held captive in Angband indefinitely. So remember, we had a few different, we, we wanted to illustrate the different outcomes of Sauron's uh, elf capture program, right? So we have the elf who is captured and who escapes of his own, under his own will, right? And that's Rog. We had one who is captured and who is uh, deceived and influenced uh, uh, and sort of made into a spy, um, but not completely uh, broken, not someone who is who actually, under the influence of the spell of bottomless dread, actually betrays um, the, uh, the the you know the the elves, uh, and so the one who that so that's Anile, the one who is influenced but not totally broken, and Evelos, Engron's wife, is the one who is totally broken, and then we wanted somebody who is just captured and never comes back and is remains a slave uh, in Angband, and so. Um, uh, she was the one that we were suggesting there. Murray says, you know, we can have her, the captured one, married to Caranthir or Maglor instead, if we prefer. Um, I'm a little tempted by that, actually, Marie. And here's the primary reason. Of all of the... Of all of the sons of Feanor, there's only one of them who really importantly... Who need, like who needs an important wife, right? And that's Kurafin, right? Because, like, Celebrimbor, right? Um, he's the only one who's... There's a... You know, Fanor may have seven sons, but he only has one grandchild of note, right? Uh, and that's Celebrimbor. Uh, so... And Celebrimbor, although he is like his father, is also unlike his father and disavows the deeds of his father... Uh, and therefore would seem to have to have a strong maternal influence, right? I mean, uh, you know, he we know he has a mom, and there's all kinds of reasons, I, it seems, to believe that inasmuch as Celebrimbor rejects the works of his father, it is through the influence of his mom um, that, he, uh, that he does that. So in a sense, I think... Now, I, I want to be careful because I don't want to recapitulate too much, but I do see a, you know, a parallel here. Just as Kurafin is one of the sons of Feanor who is most like Feanor, and we have him not, you know, he's not a Feanor clone, um, but he shares many of Feanor's attributes. Uh, and so, for him and his, uh, for him and his wife to ha to be sort of in a parallel situation to Feanor and his wife. Um, seems to me to work. Um, and so I think I might kind of, um, uh, I might kind of want her to, well, all right. So Rhiannon is saying that um, she is willing to go with Kurafin into exile where like Nerdanel, Fanor's wife wasn't. Yes, that's true. But again, I feel like she can't just be like-minded with Kurafin, right? She and Kurafin can't really just see everything the same way, or else, again, why does Celebrimbor depart, right? Why does he abjure the works of his father? Um, it, um, maternal influence seems to be... So, again, I, I'm not saying she needs to be just like Nerdanel, 
Um, but I would imagine have her having some things in common with Nerda now. Um, she didn't draw the line in the sand, Rihanna, and I think that's important. That's an important difference, right? She doesn't draw the line in the sand and say, I'm not coming, right? She is willing, more willing to go along with him. But I think that as time goes on, um, Kurafin is going to be kind of morally speaking, going downhill, right? Until like the scheming that he's going to be guilty of in Nargothrond is going to be, you know, near the absolute nadir of his moral character. Um, there will come a point where she, I think, is going to part company with him. I would assume it's at the, you know, that she and Celebrimbor together um, part company with Kurafin. Um, so yeah, so Marie, that's kind of that is kind of what I'm thinking of. I'm kind of thinking we might want Kurafin's wife around later on. I mean, she could get captured and disappear now, and Celebrimbor be remembering her, and so I mean, it would make. Uh, we would just have to be sort of suggesting that her influence on him in his youth was sufficiently strong that he like remembers the lessons of his mom. You know, we could even say Rhiannon that one of the main differences between Kurafin's wife and Feanor's wife, you know, and Nerdanel was that Nerdanel refused even to go along at all. Kurafin's wife said, I'll go along because I want to try to, you know, I want to try to influence him for good. You know, I want to try to keep, Kurafin under control, you know, uh, uh, and anyway. Um, so again, they just have sort of a difference of strategy there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yes, Rhiannon says it will be particularly horrible for Celebrimbor when he realizes that Anatar was the reason he never saw his mom again. Yeah, you know, Rhiannon, uh, connecting that... Ca okay, Rhiannon, that's a pretty strong argument for having it be her, isn't it? Uh, when Anatar, the bringer of gifts, is revealed as, like, the person who uh, uh, imprisoned and enslaved Celebrimbor's mom. Oh, gosh. Ah, hmm. See, you're tempting me now, Rihanna. I was ready to firmly say I want Korofin's wife around later on, but now, now I'm less confident. Um, that would be very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Uh, I think we should do it. Yeah, hard to resist. Okay, fine, fine. It's Korofin's wife who's captured. In which case, I think that we have to... I think it makes it even more important. If she were more aligned with Kurofin and only differs with him when he go like drops below a certain level, right? Um, she he wouldn't have reached that level by now, and so therefore she would not have influenced Celebrimbor in this way. If Celebrimbor is going to only separate from his father, due in part to like the memory of what his mom taught him, right, and what he and what she showed him through her example that example has to be pretty strong, right? So I, so maybe she should be uh, a much stronger voice for good. Um, but again, the difference between her and Nerdanel then would lie in the fact that she was, in a sense, more active than Nerdanel. Nerdanel took a stronger stand, right? Um, uh, you know, she told Feanor, like, if you do this, I will not have any part with it and I will not go along with it. And that was very strong, a very strong stance for Nerdanel to take. And she stuck to it even to, you know, separate, you know, allowing, you know, her all of, you know, not only her husband, but all seven of her sons to leave her, um, rather than go along with what Fanor is doing. Um, Kurafin's wife could be no less strong again, but just different in strategy. Um, Tony says also uh, Kurofin losing his wife it makes Kurofin a little bit more sympathetic if he becomes sort of more embittered after this. You know, if he... Ah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's kind of nice. It, it, it is kind of... It would be kind of nice if, if Feanor's sons aren't just jerks just because they're jerks. Right, exactly. We already have... I mean, we have Karanthir for that role. Like the just a jerk <laughs> Feanorian, true. right? That is true. Uh, It'd be nice yeah. to get have a little have some nuance among some of the other ones. 
Exactly. So if he That's a really nice suggestion. That is a really nice suggestion. So if 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 it's in part his anger and embitterment uh, at the enslavement of his wife that you know leads him to become like more Machiavellian as time goes on, right? Less considerate to like the 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 feelings and well beings of others in order to pursue his ends. Um, yes. Yes. So, Marie, you're right. We do need to establish Kel Brimbor's relationship with his mom before her capture. We can do that a little bit afterwards, too. I mean, you know, all we need is one scene where Kel Brimbor and Kurofin talk about her after after the fact, right? After her uh, after her capture. Um, that can also, you know, help to form the audience's view of what she meant to Kel Brimbor. Um, but, yeah, we should cert- certainly try to show something if we can. Um Okay. All right. So this hasn't helped with uh, physical characteristics uh, for the actress we'd be looking for to play this person. Um, But uh, she would certainly not be like the quiet, the small, quiet, mousy kind. Um, Certainly. Um, yeah, we could. Murray, we'll see how that works. We could potentially push her capture back to season five. That seems possible. Um, we don't, at, at, unlike Edelos, for instance, we don't have any function, right, exactly, of her capture. No immediate uh, plot need for her capture instantly. Tony says he thinks Regal. Sure. Um, I can see that. Um,. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. Yeah. She should have... She should be very... Like, a, a very strong-willed character. Again, I, like Nerd and I don't, I don't want to just copy Nerd and I mean, that's my temptation, is just to be like, it's Nerd and L and Feanor Mark II. But, um, but yeah, proud, regal, uh, strong-willed, outspoken. That seems to work for me. Yeah, I, I, I think that works. Uh, for Mrs. Kurofin, whom we shall soon cease to call that. Um, uh, Anil. Anil the Sindar, who is going to eventually be Tuor's sort of foster father in the wilderness. Um, Yeah. Good. Well, Marie, I'm glad it's not just me thinking of her as Nerd and L Part 2, essentially. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. That's kind of... Seems most fitting. Um, but I think maybe softer spoken than Nerd and L. Fewer rough edges, right? Nerd and L was... I think less fiery, maybe, than Nerd and L. Um, more gentler. Um, still willing to speak her mind, but more gentler. Listen to me. Um, more gentle than Nerdanel. Um, Nerdanel would oppose Feanor like to his face. Um, I think that Kurofin's wife might be less uh, less forceful, less outwardly forceful in that way. Um, okay, so let's see. Anil. I'm thinking of him as like a, a thin, relatively... Sh- he shouldn't be physically imposing at all. Um, I'm thinking of him as a uh, slender, wiry, dark-haired guy who will... Of course, I'm primarily imagining Anil after. Like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of picturing in my head Anil Tour's foster father rather than Anil as he is before. We want, we definitely want there to be a striking before and after with him, though. Um, afterwards, the after should be. Uh, he's something like a hermit. In his later days, when he takes in tour, he's something like a hermit. Um, he should be reticent, soft-spoken, 
um, maybe even almost unwilling to speak. Um, uh, I could see him being short, Tony, absolutely. I, mostly, I, I just want him to be slight, you know, like somebody who looks like you could kind of, you know, break him pretty easily. Um, physically, I mean. Uh, beforehand... I mean, I don't want to go too extravagant with the before and after differences. Like, he doesn't have to be, you know, an arrogant, full of himself extrovert and then become, you know, the reclusive, uh, reticent uh, person afterwards. It doesn't have to be that extreme, but um, maybe somebody who is very uh, kind of sunny in personality beforehand. He can still be sort of quiet and kind of on the fringes, but like the kind of person who sort of stands on the fringes and watches and smiles and laughs and, and, you know, kind of participates by, um, uh, you know, going along with people and laughing along with people. So not the center of attention at the party, but somebody who is very much part of the spirit of the party. Um, and then from that to, uh, recluse who, uh, barely ever talks basically. Um, that's my thought for Anna. I would, say, I, would, um, I would think having him be uh, be dark of hair and even dark of skin would be good. Um, uh, other thoughts? Don't have a lot to add to that one. Yeah. A lot of these, of course. We've done most of the really big major characters in seasons two and three, so most of the new yeah. additions until we come around like next season when we bring in the humans, right? We'll have lots I'm of new, very really important excited characters. about that. Yeah, exactly. Cannot, uh, cannot wait to cast Haleth. <laughs> oh man, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, so this season our casting list is primarily made of relatively obscure elves. Um, <laughs> Another elf. Yeah. Another elf. Um, uh, a lot of Noldor. A lot of Noldor. So, okay, well, speaking, though, of non-Noldor, we have a potential other sibling of Celeborn. Uh, I'm not sure how many siblings Celeborn needs. We'll come back to this question. And I certainly don't have anything physically to suggest about Celeborn's other sibling, um, uh, physically and, and stuff. So let, let's, let's wait till we discuss the question of Celeborn's sibling uh, in a bit. Um Orifer. So we had toyed with the idea of having Orifer involved. Orifer, of course, uh, people may or may not remember, is Thranduil's dad, Legolas's grandfather, the one who is going to be killed at the Battle of Daggerlad, uh, you know, at the end of the Second Age. So um, we were thinking of involving him in the later stages of Doriath, have him be one of the survivors and refugees of Doriath, um, to sort of show the connection there with the, you know, the Sindar and, and you know, and, and so that we have some link, um, some clearer link established between the realm in Merc in Northern Mirkwood that we're going to get, of course, through into the third age, uh, and back into these older original stories, especially of course, since the elves of Nor Northern Mirkwood are so closely tied, uh, to Doriath in the sense that like the elven King and the Hobbit kind of, uh, is recycled Thingol of Doriath, right? And the elves of Northern Mirkwood are kind of recycled Doriath. So very close link in Tolkien's imagination from the beginning. Um, the so yeah we'll we'll, we'll uh, try, not not so not thinking of Kelborn's sibling thinking of Orifer, um, I think we can wait on Orifer, I think we can wait on him till next season. So let's punt. What let's punt on Orifer for now. Um, the voice of Thorondor, that is a fascinating casting. I have a suggestion for that. Yeah. Um, just for people to consider. Manway's voice, but maybe, you know, altered in some way. So it'd be Daniel Day Lewis's voice, but altered, you know, not just directly, have him do like the voice, act, voice acting. Yeah, he would do the voice, voice. acting. Yeah. Yes. I like this idea a lot. Me this too. is a great suggestion. Yep. Yeah. Thorondor should speak 
virtually with the voice of Manwe. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, absolutely not. Of that... course, Guy Wong has to be Benedict Cumberbatch, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> <You're friend. laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Not that. Um, not that. Uh, uh, as you say, altered, right? So it shouldn't sound like, yeah. you know, it shouldn't be like Daniel Day Lewis. It shouldn't be like Manway is talking, through right? Theron. Like he's ventriloquizing right. no. through Thorondor. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. No, yeah. No. yeah. No, actually, Glarong needs to be Morgan Freeman, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Glarong. Okay. I so I I love that suggestion for Thorondor. I think that's great. Um, Glarong's voice. Glaurung's voice. Okay. Can I make a confession? I make a confession. I was so excited, really excited, when the recording, the audiobook recording of the Children of Hurin came out, uh, read by Christopher Lee, right? Mm-hmm. Super excited. Yeah, yeah. I was really disappointed by his Glaurung. I like really Glaurung? was. Yeah. yeah, I, I was, I was thinking like this is going to be the greatest Glaurung ever, right? And I know some people kind of like that, but I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. He made it too. I don't know, too growly, too scratchy. It, 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 it was too strained. I didn't like it. I traditional. Think, he went traditional yeah, with it, kind yeah. of. You know what I mean? I think that Glaurung needs a honey voice. I think Glaurung should have a rich and persuasive a voice. I mean, uh, <laughs> you said honey voice. I thought of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> not that kind of a honey voice. Yes, yeah. Glaurung speaking like Winnie yeah. the Pooh. That's good. You know, uh, Sorry, uh, uh, Nick. I mean, I was Nick. I was just about to say James Earl Jones. Closer to that than, you know, um, uh, yeah. No, I would be fine with James Earl Jones as Glaurung. Um, I mean, the only problem is that if he sounds too much like Darth Vader, it, it, it sounds like, you know, sort of typecasting. But it certainly or needs, it needs to like be right, right. It needs to be a deep, mellifluous voice, I think. Um, it should be, like, creepily beautiful, his voice. You know, when he speaks, um, you know, we expect a roaring uh, and it should be um, and it should not sound. See, I don't think it should be evil sounding, really. Um, that is, I mean, it will. It should be a lovely voice, lovely to listen to, um, almost impossible to resist listening to. Right. Um insidious in its evil not you know twisted no harsh edges no uh you know not trying to make it sound like an animal talking right um yeah all true yeah that's what i think of for glaurung's voice um uh nick was asking if we were gonna if we were gonna if we didn't want glaurung to talk this season yeah, I don't remember. It's just on the list. I'm just saying that whether it's this season or next season, that's what Glaurung's voice should be. Whenever it is. Whenever it is, it should be gorgeous. That's what I'm saying. Um, okay, and uh, Karen Theor. Wait, didn't we already do Karen Theor? Or did we want to redo Karen Theor? I'm confused about why why Karen Theor was uh, was on uh, was on our list, but because I thought we did him last year. No? Did we not do them? I thought we did all the fan orients last year. I oh, we, we oh, did. we wanted new one. We we wanted to redo that one. Okay, right. Oh. So, Karen Theer the Jerk. What should Karen Theer the now Jerk we're look like? Yeah, we're recasting Karen Theer. So. And is this a is this like a mid season recasting? So when people start watching season four, they're going to be like. What? Who's that? <laughs> well, no, fortunately, you know, this is one of the great things about our totally asynchronous series, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Karen Theer. Should have a heavy jaw 
And Murray says you wanted him burly enough to start bar fights. Yes, I want a guy who could be in bar fights. He doesn't have to look that bright. Uh, he shouldn't be ugly. Uh, he shouldn't be ugly because he's Fanor's son, and Fanor's gorgeous. So um, he, he he shouldn't he shouldn't look like a lump, but he should be he should be burly. He should have a he should have a heavy jaw. He should. Uh, have a good sneer. He has to have a really good sneer. Sneering is Carinthier's like go-to facial expression. Yes. Yep. He can't be a wussy little skinny guy. No way. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know, he doesn't have to be... I'm not picturing Carinthier built like an NFL linebacker, you know? I'm not... I'm not. When I say Burley, I don't mean that. But he's got to be... Carinthier talks like somebody who's daring you to punch him in the face, right? Like, I dare you to take the first swing, is, is how Carinthier talks, right? You know, I, I really... Yeah. So he needs to be... Do you think he'd be vain? I mean, I'm thinking about, like, the guy who's, like, you know, goes to the gym and he makes sure he's got a six-pack and, you know what I mean? He's kind of, like, into his body and stuff. I mean, would he be that kind of guy? And it, that would be the guy that would start bar fight. Like a bouncer, even. At a, right. At a, at a bar, like, would Karen right? Thier wear a wife beater? Is that what you're asking? Oh, yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There I'm thinking, go. yeah. Really, and I'm even now thinking curly hair because you got me going down the Italian road here. <laughs> <laughs> I, um that would work for me that would work for me um let's see yeah as marie says he has to be able to cash the checks that his mouth writes absolutely absolutely um that was that's a good one marie yep yep uh yes um, and yes, mm hmm, mm hmm. I think that's enough. I think it's enough to go on. Um, is he going to be somebody? But should he be really pretty? In, are you or, or or just somebody who's really like sculpted? I can see somebody who's really physically sculpted being in this yeah room. that's what i'm thinking yeah. not pretty not like traditionally or classically not facially handsome, pretty necessarily no. but no. but yes has to be really cut right muscularly <laughs> yeah and into He's it a, you know like really he, into it like if there were mirrors in middle earth at this point he'd be like yeah in front of them all the time he definitely has a gold's gym <laughs> membership exactly <laughs> that's it exactly exactly he does like i think i think I think the main thing is that he he should be credit he should be like credibly dangerous, mm -hmm. which which maybe doesn't doesn't necessarily certainly needs to be conveyed at least somewhat by his his appearance and physicality, but it doesn't necessarily have to be sort of in terms of his size or mus musculature. He should could be like the way he carries himself, but he should should seem like a credible threat if yes. it came to yes to definitely. Fisticuff. Definitely, he's not the greatest warrior of the Noldor, right? Um, but yeah, but I agree. I mean, it's, he's gonna look like if he is not fit at all physically imposing, right? Especially if he is towered over by his brothers and everything, um, he's just gonna look. He's 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 gonna be like a twit. He's gonna look more like an annoying little loudmouth that you want to step on rather than. Um, somebody who is more like a bully than somebody who is, you know, uh, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah. As Nick says, if he and Mithros have a stare down, it shouldn't look like he'd get demolished. Right. Exactly. Mithros can stare him down, but, but it would take a little doing. Um, yes. I see him being, 
Mythros can match him. Kelegorm would be pretty close. But Carinthir has to be at least like number three in physical, no, no lower than number three in physical imposingness among all of his seven brothers. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Good. Um, okay, excellent. So let's see. So we have a little bit of time before we actually end on time. So let's go through some of these questions that we've been dodging uh, here or alluding to. So first is the renaming of Rog. Uh, so Rog's name is a philological problem. Um, uh, and uh, this has to do with the fact that Rog was named Rog back in the teens. And Tolkien's language has changed tremendously since that time. So uh, the word Rog um, no longer fits uh and doesn't really work um so uh we need to rechange him to rechange him to redo his name sorry i apologize uh um marie this is what so marie had done all the accents properly and then it got translated funny in my version of powerpoint here so my apologies for the little weird characters on the on your screen here uh but anyway um uh so i don't have First of all, let me just say almost any of these questions about the names and stuff in particular, I do not have strong opinions. I don't know if you guys do. I would kind of not like to go for the joke name, though it's kind of funny. Um, uh, I have to admit, ever since I first read the Book of Lost Tales, or when I first read the Fall of Gondolin in the Book of Lost Tales, Rog was like my favorite character. Uh, so I kind of am inclined towards Rogrin. Uh, the the one which is closer to Rog because I I really like I would you know to me if he's named something like Lagor or Legrin uh, or uh, Enerthil or something like that he won't really be Rog like, he'll always be Rog to me is what I'm saying I'm <laughs> so, a fan of that I think right, there's no reason for us to go way a far field really yeah, right Just I, I think fit yeah I think making Her. it fit so yeah I I I think Rog I like those two I like Rogrin the be the better of the two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I would vote for Rolgrin. Um, wow, we got done with that really fast. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I mean, I get great <laughs> suggestions, and you know, if yeah. somebody feels really passionately, you know, on this subject, again, I'm, 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 I'm willing to somebody to try to convince me. Um, but uh, oh yeah, Nick, actually, I would like to call that out. Uh, Nick is in a is in complete agreement with us and totally endorses what we're saying without any resistance. So this is a moment, Nick, that we do. Oh my know. God! Write that down. <laughs> July eleventh, two thousand nineteen. He's still my pattering heart. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, yeah. No, Move so on that's quick good. before he changes his mind. Exactly. Okay, so uh so uh that uh, uh Mrs. Kurafin, what are we going to name her? Uh I, I whoop, sorry, here I moved away from our slide here. Um I think uh, I I um we had uh, several different suggestions. Rhiannon I think was the one who suggested Dirio and I really like that name actually. Um um Quenar or Quenari, I got either of these would work really, uh, um, would work really fine for me. Uh, but I, of these, I kind of like Duriel best. Either, and uh, do you guys have strong opinions? I, I like Duriel best, also. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. Again, also like it. I'll take any, but Dirio would be my choice. All right. Oh wait, hang on. But we have other questions. Let's let's go back to the our list here. Um, Oridreth. So we've been, I I've been punting the question of Oridreth for a long time. So let's be clear about this. In the published Silmarillion, Oridreth is the son of Finarfin. He is the young. He is the you know basically Finrod Felagun's kid brother, right? Um. Tolkien shifted the genealogies about uh, and made Oridreth later on, decided that Oridreth should instead be the son of Engrod, uh, and so therefore the grandson of Finarfin rather than the son of Finarfin and the nephew of Finrod Felagund rather than his kid brother. Um, the most important element, of course, of the change of Oridreth however, is not just him being shifted down a generation, um, uh, 
but also the fact that um, uh, we, uh, that he's also the father of Gilgalad um, in the later genealogy. The again, the published Silmarillion genealogy of Gilgalad is that he's the son of Fingon. That's what is there um, in the published Silmarillion text. But again, that's a thing that Tolkien was kind of shifting around. Um, the Gilgalad question, um, the Gilgalad question, Gilgalad is a problem. I find Gilgalad a problem. Um, and to me, he's a bigger problem than Oradreth. And the reason I've been avoiding talking about Oradreth is because I haven't wanted to talk about Gilgalad. Um, maybe we can just continue to punt the Gilgalad question down the road. But here's why I say I think Gilgalad is a problem. The reason that Gilgalad is a problem um, he is one of, so there are several examples of Elvish characters who were not part of Tolkien's original vision when he was doing the Silmarillion stuff, right? From the Book of Lost Tales uh, through the, you know, 1930 Quentin Alderinwa, you know, and the, you know, 1937 Quentin Silmarillion. Um, like in those earlier versions of this, you know, first age material, um, there are several characters who are not part of that. Very notably, of course, Gilgalad and Galadriel, neither one of them present uh, in that. Galadriel is, um, uh, is of course, invented during the writing of The Lord of the Rings. When they get to Lothlorien, he's like, oh, wait, maybe there should be a queen, and bam, there's Galadriel, and then she just blows up um, uh, uh, in a good way, not in a bad way. So anyway, um <sighs> Galadriel, he does... Okay, so I was about to say he does some writing of Galadriel back into the story. Really, of course, the problem there is not too little writing of Galadriel back into the story, but almost too much. There are too many different versions of writing Galadriel back into the story. Um, but he did much less with Gilgalad. So Gilgalad as a character emerges for the last alliance, right? Um, there needs to be who is the king of the elves... Uh, in Middle-earth, who uh, fights with Elendil in the Last Alliance. And in the very, very early versions, when the when the Last Alliance concept was first conceived, it was Elrond. Elrond was the like guy who was leading the elves uh, in Middle-earth. And so, therefore, logically, he should be the one who is fighting in the, in the Last Alliance. But Gilgalad emerges soon... Um, uh, in that, I mean, he's 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 almost, but not quite, contemporaneous with the with the conception uh, of the Last Alliance. But he's another one of those examples of those elves who were invented during the course of writing later stories, right, Second and Third Age stories, but which need to get retrofitted back into the First Age, right? But which never get fully retrofitted by Tolkien into the First Age. So. One of the, um, in the published Silmarillion as it stands, <clears throat> I have always found one of the least satisfying things in the entire published Silmarillion to me is the non-story of Gilgalad, right? So like, oh, like there, cause there's that one gesture, um, which I suspect to have been composed by Christopher Tolkien about how he gets like shipped off to the Isle of Balar for reasons, right? Uh, and then like he just never comes in at all. Um, but anyway, so I, I, and he would have to predate Elrond in terms of when he shows up, of, yep. of course, right, yep. and be cl probably closer to Galadriel in terms of age. I would think. I mean, Ordreth is they're just. I mean, obviously we can't have him here now because they just got married. But pretty soon, I would think. Well, see, exactly. Like basically, the issue, the the the, the big issues with Gilgalad, right? One of two things has to happen, neither of which happens in the published Silmarillion. Either A, he needs to be part, you know, we need to build a role for him somewhere or other in the, yeah. in the these first age events, yeah. right? Um, or B, or two, I forget how I started numbering it, uh, <laughs> we need to come up with a darn good reason not to, right? Why is he not involved if he's not involved? Um, uh, so... Um, Anyway, uh, that's, um, that's, I, I, I don't, so actually tell you what, making him the son of Ordreth makes him easier to punt, actually. 
it's, it's as you say, Trish, if he's the son of Ordreth, yeah. Ordreth just getting married here, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, Finduilus, of course, needs to be the daughter of Ordreth. You know, she's going to be right. important, right. obviously, uh, in the Turin story. So maybe he could be Finduilus's little brother. Little or brother. Something. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of the time spans. I would have to look, and I'm sure there's folks on here that probably know better than I do, but I mean, it'd be nice to have Gil Galed take a small part, like be a herald himself of someone. I mean, he'd almost know, have to be. Point. He'd almost have yeah. to be. I mean, how does he end up high king for crying out loud? I know, loud? that's the thing. I mean, that's why I was thinking he'd probably have to be awfully close to Galadriel, because, I mean, you know, you got Celeborn and Galadriel already there, and all of a sudden Gil Galad is high king. Why would that be? You know? Yeah. No, it doesn't even make any sense. Like we I can said, deal with that later. It Maybe is they to can me the most... piss somebody off or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is to me the most unsatisfying element, uh, uh, you know, the most unsatisfying single element of, the... and it's a, it's tiny, so it's not a huge deal, but, uh, you know, things that I would point to that I dislike about the publisher. And again, well, it's... it is so strange that he, I mean, at least with Galadriel, he went back into what, Unfinished Tales and, you know, wrote the various things. And I mean, he never, yeah. Yeah, he never really... Actually, you know, I think Tolkien liked rewriting and rewriting women's stories. I mean, he did the same thing with Arwen, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to its extent. Arwen, same way. I mean, you know, he, he could never quite land <laughs> with the women in his stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, we certainly, we, we give ourselves a big leg up on the Gilgalad issue by making him, by pushing him down the mm -hmm. the generations right if he's yeah. the kid brother of Finduilas, right daughter of oradreth who is um the son of angrod who is the son of right so i mean if he's four generations removed, yeah right um right we can have i mean he won't play a huge role in that most of the first age stuff because he's a kid yeah right right um but he's still older as brie points out he's still older than elrond Right, obviously. Right, exactly. You um, want to make him older than Elrond for sure. So yes, he's going yeah. to be the like mentor figure to Elrond, and so that has to be. But if we have him be one of the survivors of Nargothrond, so he's like the, you know, what, like the boy prince of Nargothrond who survives essentially there you and go. then grows like up it. down, you know, in Balar. Yep. That's, um, uh. Yeah, now Marie, I agree. If he's Fingon's son, how he becomes High King isn't too confusing. Except then, like, where the heck was he this whole time? Is that's is more problematic. Problematic. Right? No, I like this other one where he's like four generations or whatever. Yeah, many generations. it make, it does make but it he's more got a manageable. Lineage. So, yeah. yeah, I so I'm fine with this. In some ways, I like better. Um, I mean, so Ordreth. Ordreth's, like, the development of, or, or the change in Ordreth's character over time is an interesting one. Um, uh, it's an interesting one because he he gets kind of shunted aside over the, over the you know, the history of the writing of the Silmarillion material. Um, he's a much bigger character originally. I mean, he is just flat the king of Nargothrond um, in, like, say, the alliterative, um, uh, you know, Narn. Um you know, way back, uh, which Tolkien was writing in like the twenties. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, I have uh, a thought. Um, if Gilgalad can be young enough for this at the fall of Nargothrond, he ends up getting fostered by someone, which may gives he and Elrond kind of this interesting bond yes. of having been fostered. Well, and you'd think, I mean, the logical people to foster him, would be uh, to Orinidro, right? Right, that's true. Presumably. Yep. Um, yep. So, you know, he'd be kind of in the family. And Kierden, right? Sure, Kierden would that's be right. involved there too. I mean, I'm just like, I'm thinking of like, okay, so who's alive, right? You know, which which <laughs> of our major characters survived to, uh, to that point? Um, almost nobody else from, almost, I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, obviously... Uh, we're a long ways from the Nargothrond story, so we may have more named elves involved, yeah, <clears throat> you know, by that time than we think. Of course, um, we could always have a son of Fan or foster him, you know, just yeah, because yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting. Bree says uh, we end up having Idril and Oradreth being part of the same generation of elves, both heirs to falling to falling kingdoms. 
and are therefore foils to each other in how they handle those scenarios. Oh, that's, very interesting. That's really interesting, Bree. Yeah, it's really perceptive, Bree. Yeah, that is. Uh, I mean, of course, the, they're in different positions in that uh, Gilgalad would be, or Oradreth. Yeah. Yeah, that's That gives some interesting story angles. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, yeah. Yes, Oradreth is the one who fails of insight, right? Whereas... Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, you know, Bree. Now I'm thinking about this parallel that you're establishing, right? Uh, you can almost see the bridge into Nargothrond that Oradreth agrees to let Turin build is like the exact inverse of the secret tunnel right. of Gondolin, right? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, both of them famously involved in public works projects. Uh, Something but kind of Fellini-esque about that too, don't you think? Hmm. Fellini-esque about that. There's yeah. something sort of Fellini-esque about that, you know? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. The overt bridge versus the secret tunnel. Right. No, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so, no, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. All right. So I'm sold uh, I'm sold on Oradreth as the child of Angrod. It also, it makes it a little bit less weird. One of the things that's a little weird about Oradreth's genealogy in uh, um, in the published Silmarillion this is about him being Finrod's kid brother. I keep saying kid brother because Finrod treats him like a kid brother. I mean, you know, he's he's constantly getting Finrod's leftovers. You know, he's like Finrod's mini me all the way through the published Silmarillion. You know, um, and uh, that's a little um, hard to understand because no other younger siblings are treated that way. I mean, like. One question, which is, you know, it's like, what, what, why does an Oradreth get his own kingdom, right? You know, why is he the only one who gets kind of shunted aside and is forced to, not forced to, but ends up, you know, just playing second fiddle to his big brother all the time? Um, that's kind of unusual. And, um, you know, we can, um, I'm not saying we couldn't make that work. But I think that this is better. So exactly, if we see, if he's Finrod's nephew, um, it's just easier to understand, right? He's an adult, as Marie was reminding us, he's an adult, like, when, when he leaves Valinor, right? So we don't have him leaving Valinor as a kid and growing up. Um, but, you know, he's definitely younger. And um, in that role, you know, so therefore he would be kind of taken in by Finrod, especially so you think about post-Dagor Bragalach, right? I mean, Angrod's going to die. Um, uh, Angrod's going to die on the Dagor Bragalach, so Oradreth coming to live with Finrod and being taken essentially as Finrod's heir comes to now, instead of looking like a patronizing way to treat your younger brother, it becomes... A, yeah, that's a good point. A, 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 a touching way to treat the son mm -hmm. of your deceased brother, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. So it's, it makes it feel a little more natural for have him, for, to, for, to have him be the protege in that way. Um, and yeah, Rhiannon says that seeing his mother driven mad by the spell of bottomless dread could be one of the things that shapes Oradreth's character. You certainly would think that it would, right? And Rhiannon, I wonder if there is a way in which it... One of the things that Oradreth... Oradreth is ultimately going to fail in being too weak, right? He's going to give it... He's going he's gonna to become Turin's welcome mat um, at Nargothrond, and he's going to let Turin run the show um, when he should assert himself more, when he should resist Turin. Um, he is going to be steamrolled by Turin Turambar, not to mention disregarded completely by Caligorm and Kurafin. So um, the idea that the death of his father and the uh, madness of his mother would c affect him, right? To make him more timid, more uncertain, less assertive. Um, even, I would even be, I mean, showing him when Finrod takes him in, right? When Finrod takes him in, especially after the death of his, after the, you know, so like in season five, showing Oradreth in season five as like, shell-shocked, you know, somebody who's really struggling to deal with the horror. I mean, I could see Oradreth as being a really logical place where we are articulating the difficulties of, like, 
you know, the, the emotional impact. We've talked about the emotional impact of the kinslaying, right? And we're sort of showing that in some different ways, especially with Goadriel, showing her kind of working through the, you know, how to cope with the kinslaying and, and her, you know, role in that and her, you know, the, her memories of that. Um, Oradreth could be like our, you know, the the young Noldo who has PTSD from the horrible things that have happened since they arrived, right? Um, and can really kind of demonstrate a bunch of that. Yes, Rhiannon says it's almost like secondhand spell of bottomless dread. Um, yeah, in a sense, right? And see him trying to deal with that. And, and again, see him being brought in by... Um, uh, by Finrod as being an act of, of, of pity as well as uh, of, you know, love there. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I'm thoroughly talking myself into this. So Oradreth, son of Angrod and, and Evelos, yeah, works. And Gilgalad, kid brother of Finduilas, daughter of Oradreth, that'll work to uh, that that'll make a bunch of things much simpler it's also we got to keep in mind gonna confuse a lot of people um there will be many tolkien fans uh who will be confused as to why the heck gilgalad is the son of ordreth um but you know we're just gonna have to deal with that um yes there is well the answer to that to them is well what would you do right <laughs> exactly. you think you could do it better fine exactly Exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, the last question that we hadn't answered, um, apart from the que the decision to punt or refer to season five, was the question about uh, uh, another sibling for Celeborn. So we want Nimloth to be related to Celeborn, but we already have a sister for Celeborn who's going to be the one who's still there, um, like in the frame, still there in the Third Age. Um we had her being the spokesperson for the anarcho syndicalist commune that is the Green Elves post the death of Denethor. Um, uh, <clears throat> do we need another sibling? So if we don't have another sibling, then Nimloth has to be her daughter. Are we okay with that? I think I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I don't also know. Also okay with it. Yeah, I. Un, we can come back to this later if you guys on the script team or on the discussion boards think there's a really good reason, like, can give us a really good reason why Nimoth should not be the daughter of the sister of Celeborn we've already invented. Um, but uh, but I, I would be fine having her come in, her, Nimloth, come in from that angle. I should be okay. Um Okay, cool. Excellent. Look at that. Can I point out that we did all the things and we're done early. We're ahead of time. You better watch out. You're going to break your arm patting yourself on the back. I one. know. This has never <laughs> happened before. Well, you know, you can't. I mean, this is even more rare than Nick agreeing with us. Um, so, you know, there you go. So for next time, we are going to move on to the next two episodes and action packed episodes. They promise to be episodes nine and 10. Um, so we're going to have the Dagor Aglareb. We're going to have our big battle scene of, uh, of season four. We're going to have the dreams from Oma. We're going to get the, 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 the Gondolin and Nargothron inspiring dreams. Um, we're going to have Fingolfin's reaction to the ban, right? We had the ban from Thingol last time. We're going to have the, the, you know, the, the Noldorin reactions, we're going to commission Narsil. We're going to have to do the whole Edelos's unwitting tre treachery and how that's going to play out with this, with this, uh, with the spell of bottomless dread uh, and uh, 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 Oradreth's horror. Um, lots of things going on here in the next two episodes. We're at the, in the, the really kind of some of the dramatic high points here, action sequence, high points uh, of season four. Um, so that's next time. And next time is two weeks from tonight on July 25th. Where Wednesday, are July we 25th. in the season with these two episodes? Is it kind of mid, is it, is this kind of the midpoint? I, I, I've it's lost a little, track. So, I mean, the, 
really like the ban and the dag and the Dagor Aglareb are kind of like the big turning points. Yeah, um, right, right. I was trying to think yeah, where they were in the season if they're kind of in the middle sort of. Yeah, no, we're right. Yeah. We're right at the, you know uh, the the climax and the immediate aftermath of the like you know the the big oh, okay. sort of turning point of the season here. Yeah. Yeah. So heading cool. towards it's you know it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that is remarkable about this season, about season four, is that we're not we're not hurtling towards a major action sequence. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we we have one. Like we're going to have the escape of Glaurung. There will be action in the final uh, in the but in a sense that action is really only kind of foreshadowing of things to come. The mm -hmm. the the major things that. Um, you know the, the the real culmination of the season is going to be the wedding of Galadriel and Celeborn. I mean, the, right. the dealing with the past and reconciling and forgiveness—that's been our theme all the way from the beginning. So the uh, the the founding of Gondolin and Nargothrond, the um, the marriage of Galadriel and Celeborn, those comparatively low action moments mm -hmm. are really the sort of thematic culmination of things. Um, the escape of Glaurung is just a bit of, uh, uh, in some ways, a bit of excitement and a bit of a teaser of what's to come. Kind right? of a foreshadow, yeah. Yeah, yeah teaser, exactly. that's right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, excellent. Um, <laughs> I want to apologize to all of you who are listening to this asynchronously, who have really long commutes, who were counting on this. To right, like, exactly. Like, yeah, right. Why are they done an hour no. early? Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Oh, exactly. didn't even think about all those poor people who've, who've, who've who were counting count on, on it. Us. To, yeah, right. right. Well, the good news is that I've already done... There's always done... exploring Lord of the Rings. So. Right, exactly. There are, the, I'm, I'm also doing seven and a half other hours of other content in different <laughs> shows this week. So, you know, you should be able to find something to uh, keep you occupied. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see uh, our live friends back here at... Well, okay. Not our live friends versus our dead friends. I mean, we'll see <laughs> our friends who join us live uh, Thursday, July 25th uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. And I will say, as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed. Although the theoretical budget of our hypothetical blockbuster may be unlimited, the production budgets of this and the rest of our fun alternative educational projects are unfortunately not. If you have enjoyed joining our production team, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.